Thank you, Jeff, for the nice introduction. I'm very excited to be here to talk about MXV Rail and uh, our ability to contribute to our industry. So let's get started. First, I want to introduce MXV Rail. Uh, we like to say we are the world's leading talent for rail research, consulting, training, and testing. Our organization has been around for quite some time uh, and are really purpose-driven focused on moving our industry forward in the ways of maximum safety, reliability, efficiency, and resiliency. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about our history, uh, how we contribute to the industry, both in the strategic research initiatives, but also in the commercial space. Talk a bit more about our capabilities uh, and how we're helping to move the industry forward. First, let's talk a little bit more about our organization, really what it means to be part of MXV Rail. Recently, you'll see that we changed our name from TTCI to MXV Rail. I'll talk to you a bit about why that change occurred in the next few slides, but I'd really like to take some time to talk about what our organization stands for. Uh, momentum, MXV Rail, many of you are probably familiar with the mathematical term for momentum. We thought it was a very fitting term to name our organization after because we really do provide the momentum to help the industry move forward. We are a team of amazing individuals with a lot of insight. Uh, over the years, the industry has invested in our talent pool, and we are available to support the industry with our subject matter expertise. We always like to say that teamwork is a big driver, and that doesn't just mean the work that we do uh, within MXC Rail, but also the work that we do collaboratively with universities, industry, and government entities. Ruger is a very important one in an engineering organization because we never set for last year's results. And because we are doing things that are outside of the box and traditionally sometimes outside of uh, what you want to occur in the revenue service, it's really important that we do our due diligence prior to executing on any of the work that we do. And last, I touched a little bit about it in our in that first slide, but we really are a purpose-driven organization. And what that means is you have over 250 passionate individuals really focused on making our industry better. Uh, we have a unique board of directors makeup that I'll show you in just a few slides, but it's really nice to have have the support of the industry helping us find new technology innovations and also bringing new product to market that's helping create a safer working environment for everybody in the industry and for our communities. So let's talk a little bit about that uh, board makeup because we are a unique organization. We are industry owned, but independently operated. And what that means is that our chairman of the board is Ian Jeffries from the AAR. Uh, we are represented by the six class one railroads. I'm, I'm getting better about moving from six, from seven to six, <laughs> um, but we have representation. Most of our, uh, the people on our board from those railroads are the chief operating officers, which comes really handy when we're talking about our research program and how we are going to progress the, the projects that are selected within that program. Uh, we also have new short line representation, which is an important element if you think about the fluidity needed between the short lines and class ones to make our uh, to move freight across the country. So RJ Corman and GNW joined our board at the end of 2023. So we're excited to have them on board. Uh, last but not least, we do have representation from Amtrak and Metra. We still we continue to work in the passenger space, although with some of the recent changes, our ability to execute large testing programs is um, less than it was in, in prior years. So let's talk a little bit about our journey because it has been a change. Uh, I always like the opportunity to talk a little bit about the organizational history and how it's evolved over the last couple of years. Uh, one of the great things about our industry is that it's always been very focused on being a better industry, whether that be in, the, in terms of safety or customer service. Uh, from a research perspective, the AAR has had a research component since its inception in 1934. So we have a very longstanding history of trying to make our industry better. In 1982, we actually started to work on uh, under a care custody control agreement with the federal government out at the facility that's also in Pueblo that's known as the Transportation Technology Center. Uh, at the time, that center was actually going to uh, go into closure. And instead of going to closure, AAR stepped in and decided that it was a, a good research tool for the rail industry and set up an agreement with the FRA to be able to operate out of that facility. So that longstanding relationship between 1982 and 1998, AAR operated that particular facility. In 1998, the research outcomes were growing for the organization for AAR 
uh, which is when TTCI, Transportation Technology Center, was formerly established. TTCI was incorporated as a subsidiary of the AAR and really started to flourish not only in the AAR's research programs, but also helping the commercial clients bring some of their ideas to life. Over a 40-year history of working very closely with FRA at the TTC, uh, we were able to do some amazing things together uh, with collaborative research, not only with with between the industry, the FRA, but also with university programs. I always like to highlight that um, the university programs are imperative for being able to do some of the work that's more on the cutting edge uh, and helping us to really take those technologies and implement them in a meaningful way with industry. In 2021, uh, the FRA decided they wanted to move a direct, different direction with the TTC, which made us come to a decision point as an organization and working with our board about what the organization was going to look like moving forward. In about March of 2021, because of the change in, in decision by FRA, we decided to rebrand. We moved from TTCI to MXV Rail. You can understand that there was quite a bit of confusion between the company, TTCI, that ran the FRA facility, the TTC. And so all the same wonderful people, much of the capability that we had at TTC was then relocated from the existing old site to new facilities also in Pueblo, Colorado. I'm happy to report that as of uh, September, at the end of September of 2022, uh, MXB Rail was operating out of what we're looking at as a multi-campus operation. Uh, we have one of our facilities that is just south of the old test facility and one that is a little bit closer to town. I'll give you an area aerial view so you get a better idea of what that looks like shortly. So this is a high level overview of uh, the achievements we were able to work through uh, over a two year period after learning we were going to relocate from the TTC to new facilities. Uh, you'll see in the upper left-hand corner, we have our laboratory facilities. It's located in Pueblo's Airport Industrial Park. It's about 11 miles from the prior facility. Then we move on to our actual in-track and track structure, track testing, and CERTC area. This is located on a Army base that's actually moving towards closure. The property for the Army base is being turned over to a local economic development company called Pueblo Plex. Pueblo Plex is looking for ways to redevelop it. And the timing just was fantastic for us because we needed a lot of land and a lot of new rail infrastructure and Pueblo Plex was the place. Pueblo Plex is about 12 to 15 miles south of the old test facility. So we actually share a main line that goes through our facility out to the TTC. As we made this move, it was very important to us to make sure that we were not duplicating the infrastructure that we had at the TTC. Rather, we wanted to look at our operations and understand how the industry had evolved, and we wanted to make sure that we were building what the industry was going to need well into the future. So what you see at our new test facility is a series of on-track testing capabilities. I'll give you a bit more detail on those in a few slides. We also have an impact wall where uh, we do a lot of work for our damage prevention and lading services and other customers interested in understanding how impacts can either impact their car builds or their commodities. We also built a heavy duty maintenance facility to be able to do all of our car repair work. And then the last piece of it is really geared at our security and emergency response training center. We refinished a 90,000 square, square foot warehouse to accommodate some of our training and rebuilt a new set of training grounds so that our first responders had an area for being able to do hands-on large scale scenarios. Talk a little bit about the testing work that we do at our new facility. We like to say we have one vision, uh, four different sets of test tracks. We include the specialized test labs that we have uh, at our place near the industrial park. But really with that set of capabilities, we have unlimited potential to help the best ideas move forward. The specialized laboratories, again, located at the airport industrial park, range in capabilities. We do a lot of work for damage prevention lighting services in terms of strap testing, but we also have some one-of-kind test equipment. Uh, what you see in the picture, kind of in the top center of this particular slide, is our rolling contact fatigue simulator. That particular piece of equipment is one of a kind. Uh, we worked with MTS to build that. I think it was around the 20. 
2013-ish time frame. It's really geared at trying to better understand the wheel rail interface and the conditions under which fatigue cracks and rolling contact fatigue are generated and how we might be able to prevent that in the future, whether it be with different lubrication techniques or different materials for either the wheel or the rail. We also do a lot of additional AAR standards testing. Uh, we have equipment to support ARIMA tie testing. So you can actually see the bottom right of your slide. It's kind of a bluish test rig. That's a three post machine that we use for a lot of the ARIMA performance testing before it goes out into the lab. One of our favorite areas though in this particular lab is our metallurgy lab. We actually have invested heavily in the last five years to make sure that we have a full service capable metallurgy shop. So we have SEMs, all of our own polishing and sample preparation machines. So we have a lot of capability to be able to understand from the micro level, moving into the macro level with the RCFS. And then I'll talk to you a bit more about revenue service testing that we do in a few slides. I did want to give you a quick overview of the track infrastructure, what we use those tracks for, and how they're supporting work in the industry. So the first piece of infrastructure that we had in place in, it was probably late 2022, is our high-speed loop. This particular loop is about six miles in length. It's class six track, so we can reach speeds up to 110 miles an hour in the tangent. This particular piece of track infrastructure is heavily used for endurance and performance testing. We typically have a lot of locomotive manufacturers out working on this loop, and it's been very busy since we've had it in service since around, like I said, October of 2022. Uh, what we worked on in 2023 was a series of three different tracks. First and foremost was the suspension and resonance track. We do a lot of specialty vehicle dynamics and certification testing on this particular piece of track infrastructure. This is a siding to the eight high-speed loop, so you can see that teal that runs parallel to the the high speed loop there. This is about 3.4 miles in length. This is where we have our pitch and bounce, twist and roll, yaw and sway. And what that means to anybody that may not necessarily be deep into the world of vehicle dynamics or track infrastructure is basically simulated defects that we can understand how the vehicles respond as they're traversing these different areas. Next is the curving performance track or the CPT. This is another area where we're looking at vehicle performance and ride quality. We have a range of curvatures from three degrees up to 12 degrees. And this particular piece of track is about a little over two miles in length. So again, looking at vehicle performance in combination with our instrumentation team to really see how the, the range of curvatures impacts different performance. The last piece of track infrastructure that we have put in place at our new facility is the facility for accelerated service testing. I'm sure that this is probably familiar to many of you because it really is our the premier industry test bed. The new loop is very similar in shape and size to the loop that was at the old facility. It's about a little over three miles long. This is the track infrastructure piece that we're using primarily for the strategic research initiative program. I'll talk to you more about the program goals and some of the interesting research we're doing there in a few moments, but just wanted to highlight the capability because this is also something that we can use for clients outside of our member railroads. Another area of capability outside of just the testing work that we do is our consulting. Uh, we have over a hundred different engineers that can work on various broad ranges of programs, whether that be with a railroad supplier, university. I've highlighted some of the capabilities that we have in vehicle track interaction studies. We do produce instrumented wheel sets to support understanding vehicle performance for new vehicles or modifications to vehicles that are existing. We actually have a very large department that is wholly focused on positive train control, worked very closely with the FRA for many, many years as the mandate for PTC came into being and, and moving all the way through implementation. On the back end, we're doing a lot of the systems integration and a lot of the specifications for making sure that as changes are occurring in the industry, 
everyone understands what versions of software they have and that things are being updated in a way that are going to be minimally impactful to the entirety of the industry. Last but not least, we do have many track and infrastructure specialists, which means that we get to do a lot of track studies, whether that be ballast degradation or track performance or quality issues. So a range of experts that are at the disposal of our industry. And really, we like to say, bring us challenges because that's where we thrive. Moving on to our training capability, there's a couple of ways that we interact with the industry for training. We can do technical training for engineering staff or people trying to better understand the difference between inputs and what the outcomes are going to be. Examples of that would be training in vehicle dynamics, or uh, we do offer some derailment training. The other half of our training is really being housed in our new nonprofit, which is the MXV Learning Institute. This is where we train first responders on hazardous material response and it, for all modes of surface transportation. This is the one area where we actually do go outside of just rail. So we have highway courses, we've done pipeline in the past, we do tactical training. So a wide variety of opportunities for hazardous material response and emergency responders to train, not only in the classroom, but on real live scenarios. The last area we always participate in that little pe people don't really know that we do is in the technical standards. The AAR and participating members are governed by a set of technical specifications to really ensure that interchange is done in a fluid manner. Our organization has probably around 60-ish people that are dedicated not only to maintaining and updating those standards in conjunction with the industry, but also going out and auditing for quality. So plenty of work that we do here, whether it be in shops, looking at wheel shops and uh, gauges to being able to understand the performance for damage prevention in securement and lading, a wide variety of services that are offered and, and very important from an industry perspective. Before I move on to our strategic research initiative program, I did just want to take a minute and spotlight how we work commercially with our customers. One that has been very, very well known recently is Parallel Systems. You're starting to see a lot of buzz around the rail industry news around their progress. Uh, we are working with Parallel Systems under an ARPA-E grant to be able to look at the technology and make sure that it's implemented in an efficient and safe way. I threw up a couple of pictures of their autonomous bogies and how they are intending to use those bogies in revenue service. They do have a partnership with at least one short line right now, and we're working with them to be able to do the testing at our facility first to understand performance and then helping them move that out into a broader implementation out into the industry. It's a very exciting technology geared at improving capacity on existing rail lines and really improving our ability to provide service to our end customers. So keep an eye out for this one. Like I said, they're currently with us doing some testing. Uh, we've seen positive results so far. So I think everybody in the rail world is very excited to continue to see the progress for parallel systems. Next, I want to move on to our research capabilities. You know, I talked a little bit about the research program being founded when AAR was founded. And since then, the industry continues to devote time, energy, and dollars to be able to progress the best ideas forward. Our research program is really key to advancing the safety of the industry through science-based solutions, but really encouraging collaboration by building some multidisciplinary teams. And that means using a combination of our experts with industry experts, with university experts, to really identify the most viable technologies or methodologies and apply those and test them first and then figure out how we efficiently move those into deployment into revenue service. Our strategic research initiative program is really geared at 
supporting vendors through that development cycle. So I like to say taking those ideas and helping vendors through the implementation cycle. We do that in a few ways. Uh, first and foremost, we can do uh, simulations, laboratory testing to help understand product performance before it's going into a bigger scale. We can then move into the controlled on-track testing environment, which is that fast loop I showed you. I'll give you a bit more details on that in a moment. And then finally, because we're owned by the railroads, we have a unique partnership and unique ability to be able to work very closely with them to bring new products and put them into some controlled tests on railroad property. What that means is that the sites are typically worked with a particular railroad and we're constantly monitoring the performance of those products. So this is super helpful to vendors because number one, they get some additional funding to help move their product through their product development life cycle, but they're also consistently getting feedback on how to make their product better and more reliable in service. This particular program is, like I said, supported and funded by the AAR, which is made up of all the class one railroad vendors and suppliers, but it's also designed by them. So annually they're looking at the program and whether or not these programs are providing value and we're able to make those adjustments on an annual basis. Talk a little bit more about FAST uh, and the important role that it plays. We're very happy to announce that the FAST program is actually up and running again. We were able to complete the work that we needed to in 2022 before leaving the prior facility. We started running our FAST program again toward the end of 2023, and we're expecting to get a full season of running in 2024, which means that with this new loop, any test that's out on the FAST loop is going to see about 140 MGT worth of traffic in 2024. You can see I've highlighted some specific areas that we're looking at, whether it be bridge deck and special track work. We have some detection systems that we can do comparative studies. We have zones for rail welding and friction control, track performance and temperature testing, but also a lot of tie strength and fastener testing. We also do a lot on the substructure. So we're looking at ballast settlement studies and other ways to improve ballast performance. Overall, if there's an infrastructure component being tested, we're thinking about it and, and it's likely in this loop. The industry has really enjoyed the output from this particular piece of our strategic research program. And again, we're just so excited to have it back online uh, and having a full season of operation in 2024. I did want to take a couple of minutes to talk about some of the research. I, there's overall, there's about 16 different programs that are in this particular uh, SRI program. So I don't, I won't have time to talk about all of them, but I figured I'd pull out a couple of interesting ones, starting with our bearing performance and integrity studies. I know this is a hot topic, no pun intended, but right now we're really looking at the reconditioning process and how the impacts of quality Quality reconditioning can support longer term, better performance of bearings post reconditioning. So on the left middle of the screen, you'll see some of the work that we've done on the bearing rig. So we've taken bearings that had prior defects in them, did reconditioning, and we're running them on a rig to understand how quickly defects are growing, what they look like when they do grow. So you can see on the far left of this slide, there was a spall repair that was made. We ran it for 40,000 miles on a test rig and you can see the raceway of that bearing has spalled out and has some significant damage. The middle photo is yet another test that we are running of a different repair um, and it aligns with some of the non-destructive evaluation that we're doing. So I think we've taken over 40 plus bearings, run them through two sets of tests Test. But before we started doing the testing, we did scanning with eddy current scans to understand what that defect looked like subsurface. As uh, so you can kind of see that in the color picture at the top of the screen there, red indicates that there's some form of an indication in that area. And so you may not visibly be able to see that as you're inspecting a bearing. So part of this program is really trying to identify technologies that we could put in the hands of people in a shop to help better identify any 
existing or leftover defects that would be part of the reconditioning process. That gets to that advanced testing and non-destructive and destructive characterization testing. We have been looking at methodology to deploy in our shop environment for eddy current testing, again, to reduce the likelihood that a bearing that wasn't completely addressed through the reconditioning process would be able to be identified uh, and fixed prior to being installed on a car going out into service. So this is an ongoing piece of work. I think our last publication was a technology digest in about middle of 2023. Uh, we're into the phase three work right now. This is another area where we are working with a university. And I look forward to the research results that we are going to have published probably, I would say, about mid-year this year. The second project that I wanted to highlight was our track stability research. This is an area that's been of particular interest in the industry due to higher temperatures causing track buckling. So you can see that this program has been ongoing. Uh, you'll see research in the past. It's been ongoing for a couple of years, but this one was important to highlight because it does really show the importance of collaboration, not only between MXV rail and industry, but also with our university programs. We know that track buckling is caused by several different factors. And so we're really in this study trying to figure out how those independent factors work together to be able to cause conditions that are uh, would cause track buckling. So at this point, we've looked and, and done studies on rail temperatures from train operations, looking at braking and large amounts of traffic over specific areas in revenue service. We've done some rail neutral temperature monitoring and looking at different technologies that are doing that monitoring and how they're performing. We worked with Texas A&M to start building out a track buckling model. And we've also done a track buckle test to help validate that model. You can see the results of the track buckle test actually in this photo to the left. When you see that type of uh, situation in revenue service, that is very, very bad. Fortunately for us, we get to do some fun things at our facility and we were able to actually force that track buckle so that we were able to take data throughout the process and understand, again, those variables that drove the end product of the track buckle. This research will be ongoing. Dr. Steve Wilk is in charge of this one. And so keep an eye out for publications if this is an area of interest for you. I did want to just present a couple of opportunities to learn more. I tried to provide a very high level overview of the work that MXV Rail is and the collaborations that we have. But one of the biggest areas that you can learn more about MXV Rail is in the 29th Annual Research Review. This is coming up April 23rd to 25th. First of all, if you are new to rail, we have an early career railroader workshop on the first day. Uh, this is a full day workshop with our experts going over all things rail and how MXV Rail supports the industry in some of the implementation of new technology. The second day is a day of presentations from our experts. So you would see the bearing research, the track stability research, along with about 14 other programs that we're running. And then the fun comes in, well, all of it's fun, honestly, but the real fun comes in for people that like to be hands-on. Uh, you get to take a trip out to our new facility and the new facility for accelerated service testing and get your hands on research and actually get up close and personal, not only with looking at the performance to date for each of those experiments, but also interacting with our experts in those test zones. Another area that we started probably about five or eight years ago is university days. This is a special time for us because I've impressed upon you that our collaboration with all of our university partners is very important, not only from a technological advancement perspective, but also from a getting people interested in the industry. We wanted to celebrate that in our university days, and this year we're going to be doing that August 13th to 14th. This is where we invite all of our university partners or interested people from universities to come visit the facility. This is a more expanded tour of the entirety of the facility talking about some of the research programs. So I do highly recommend this event if you are interested in learning more about rail and want some more one-on-one -on -one time with our experts. 
Uh, the last area that I wanted to point out for people that is just always amazing to me, we actually about two years ago opened up what I like to say our knowledge library to anybody that was interested in rail via our website under the knowledge interchange section. Under this section, we have all of our technology digest, which is about 1100 different publications at this point. It's a searchable database based on keywords or author name, you name it, you can search for it and you're able to download these articles. I think the only thing we ask for is an email address. So this is definitely something that can be a huge resource, a great library for people that are new to the industry or have a very specific problem. It will These technology digests are about four pages in length, give you a very high level summary of what the objective and what the outcomes were. But if you need to learn more, you can always touch base with the experts that are on the publications or uh, you could contact us through our website at mxvrail.com. I appreciate your time today. Uh, if you have more questions, I know that we have a little bit of time for Q&A, so I'm, I'm hoping that we get a few more of those. But if you need more information that we can't address today, please feel free to reach out to us again via our website. We're very active on LinkedIn. And if you want to learn more about our Security and Emergency Response Training Center, you can visit certsy.org for more information on the courses that we have, course calendar, or even registration. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate your attention. I look forward to some great questions.